hello to the people that is uh, following us uh, by uh, streaming, because as you know, this, there is also the possibility to follow this uh, roundtable by uh, streaming. And I'm sorry because uh, the people that you are here, we have a little bit problems with the screen. As you can see, is not so clear. And this, this kind of thing sometimes happens in this room. We try to fix it, but it was not possible. I'm sorry about that. Maybe if you have this kind of uh, glasses for three dimensions, <laughs> you can see. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Okay, let, let me start with uh, the presentation of this uh, round table. As you know, this morning we had a meeting, uh, an editor's meeting, um, we call a, ro a workshop, and we were talking about different topics related to the editorial process in educational technology journals and also in open and distance education journals, e learning journals, etc. We were talking. <coughs> about different topics and the idea is this afternoon uh, have a four presentation from each one of these different topics uh, each one of course from different editors of different journals attending to this uh, workshop in this morning i think we can the idea is um, start with the four presentations uh, made a break at the end of these four presentations uh, during the break, uh, of course, if you want to, uh, the, Rose will explain that it's a possibility to write the questions, etc. Just a minute break, and after it's more or less one hour or more to, to discussion and to debate about the, the four topics in these presentations. Okay. Let me start with the first one. The first one, uh, the, the title of the, pre the presentation is "Quality Assurance in Journal Editorial Processes." and it's made by uh, Nick and Rushby. Nick Rushby, uh, Professor Nick Rushby, uh, has been working in uh, the area of educational and training technology for over 40 years. His original background is in electronic engineering. During his career, he has coordinated projects for the National Development Program in Computer Assisted Learning, directed an international information center for the use of computers in education and training, lead multimedia training activities for PA Consulting Group, and he did the engineering team developing a novel web-based multimedia advertising system for airports and subway environments. He has worked with a wide variety of clients in the most business sectors and all, all levels, levels and of these organizations, including consult consulting at board level. He has edited a number of books and journals, including Programmed uh, Program Learning and Educational Technology, Interactive Learning in International, in, uh, Le Learning International, sorry, and since 1993, he is the editor of the British Journal of Educational Technology. Nick, the floor okay. is yours. Joseph, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move to yeah. the end. There we go. Yes. Ah, I can hear myself now. That's good. <coughs> well, first of all, for those who weren't in the, the session this morning, um, I'd like to um, thank the organisers of this conference um, for inviting me. The invitation arrived a little unexpectedly because um, I hadn't realised this event was, was going on. I was absolutely delighted when I realised that my diary was free for yesterday and today so I could come. And Ros and Joseph asked me if I would um, talk a bit about um, editorial quality. And I thought, that, well, that's, that sounds interesting. Um, but it wasn't really until I started um, getting down to the real work of putting together a 20-minute piece on quality assurance in journal editorial processes, um, that I realized um, two or three things. Firstly, that it was absolutely fascinating. I've, I've been an editor for a long time, as you, you heard from Joseph, um, and I've kind of done quality um, intuitively. 
okay, without really thinking about it very much. I would like to think that BJET, which is my journal, is a quality journal. But it wasn't until I started working on this short presentation um, that I realized that that was just a, an aspiration. I, ne I needed to nail it down, pin it down to the ground somehow. And one of the consequences of that is that what you're going to hear today is essentially a work in progress. It's by no means, by no means finished. Um, you guys have um, taken up probably about two months of my time for the next year, because I think that's how much time it's going to take me to run this project. Um, I've already tried to persuade one other editor um, to join me in this, and I'm um, even assuming that he says yes, I'm still looking for another one. So it's a work in progress, and I'll explain at the end what I think there is still to do. But let me just start off very briefly, for those of you who don't know, about talking um, about BJET, and I promise no more than a couple of minutes. Um, it's one of four journals which are owned by the British Educational Research Association, um, and it's one of three of those journals that's published by Wiley. Um, I've had an association with Wiley, having edited their journals now for something like 30 years. Um, so when we come on to Rory's presentation, um, you may wish to, um, and the questions that follow, um, you may wish to bear in mind that um, perhaps I'm not totally impartial um, when it comes to discussions about publishers. But then he's not totally impartial either, so there we go. Not a bit. Um, British Journal of Educational Technology. Well, in actual fact, um, it's neither particularly British. Sorry, I should have gone back at that point. Um, it's neither particularly British, um, nor is it just an educational journal. Um, it's read by quite a lot of trainers, and the British bit of it only accounts for something like 4% of our submissions and about 5% of our readers. But as anybody who edits a journal will know, you never, ever change the title of a journal. Don't do it. Um, because everybody forgets you start from scratch. So we remain the British Journal of Educational Technology. Um, there are about uh, 530, 550 submissions each year. Um, we accept about 10%. That seems to be around about norm for the, for the course. Um, we have a fairly good impact factor. It puts us 37 um, out of 200 and, what are we, 19 or so, in the education, educational research category. But impact factors are very fickle things. Your impact factor can go up and down without you doing anything about it at all. And later on this afternoon, we're going to be talking about metrics and um, uh, discussing whether impact factors actually have very much value at all, except in the eyes of our masters, our university administrations and the research councils. Two things which are quite important for authors, and one of the things which I think does relate to quality, is that our average time from submission to the first decision is just over two weeks. So authors get to know fairly quickly whether their paper has been rejected or whether it stands a chance of acceptance. And our average time from submission to final decision after some revisions is only two months. And we work very hard at keeping those figures as low as possible. I won't read through our scope. That's our, our scope. And if you want to look at it in more detail, you can find it on the website, thebjet.com. And all this is, is there for you. Um, and that's really about as much as I want to say about the journal. I'm very happy to talk to you in the coffee break or whatever about anything else you want to know. But I think that's probably all we need to know in the context of this afternoon. 
So let's look at quality, because that's what we're here for. Um, that's a dictionary definition. It comes from the Oxford English Dictionary. And we're talking about you know, excellence in some way or other, comparative excellence. Perhaps we don't need to worry too much about definitions. We would be able to distinguish between, for example, the, the quality of uh, a Mercedes-Benz and the quality of a Lada car, or the quality of a dress that you bought um, in a supermarket and the quality of a dress from Balenciaga. Without having to have a, a, a proper definition about it. And what I came to realize as I started to, to put this together was that I had no, never consciously, as an editor, put into practice the things that I had been doing when I was consulting in industry for PA Consulting Group. When, amongst other things, I was running quality improvement programs. Do you have, in, I don't know whether you have in, um, in Spanish the equivalent of um, you know, uh, the saying, cobbler's children. The children of the shoemaker do not have very high quality shoes because he's so busy making shoes for other people. And I think there was an element of, of this. But if you look at the, so the classic management uh, things you should do, we'll come back to these later, um, there are a number of steps. One of them is to identify what you mean by quality. Um, the next is to... Um, <coughs> benchmark and document what those indicators are. And then follow some processes in order to try and improve the quality. You keep monitoring these key performance indicators, in this case, key quality indicators. And keep going around a cycle, keep improving things, reviewing it, improving, reviewing and improving. Quality doesn't stand still. If you don't do anything about quality, it will start to go down. Besides which your competitors, and by that I mean about half of the people in this room, are also going to be trying to improve their quality. And if we finish up with a rubbish journal and you've all got good ones, um, that's not to our benefit. So. Once you start on quality, everybody's going to be doing quality and you've got to keep running in order to keep up. The place to start is not with the journal, but with the customers. Because as editor, we have customers. We do this for some people. We do it for the author, authors. We do it for the publisher. We do it for the reviewers. Those are the main people that the editor deals with. The publisher, whether it's a commercial publisher like Elsevier um, or whether it's a university publisher, has a number of customers as well. So this cascades down. So as an editor, we have to think about the customers at the, at the, at the bottom level, if you like, I don't deal very often with readers, the people who access the journal and read the papers. But the publisher does. And if I'm to deliver quality for the reader, I've got to deliver quality for the publishers. So we've got here a total of six um, audiences, customers, that we need to think about. And their understanding of quality differs depending on who they are. So the reviewers don't have the same perception of quality as the authors do. They're looking for different things. Okay? Right. So let's go through fairly quickly what the readers are looking for. And... 
these lists, remember, are a first draft. You are looking at a first draft here. It's a work in progress. There's more to do. But here are my initial thoughts. The readers want articles by good authors. That doesn't mean to say well-established authors, authors they've heard of, but they want authors that they can believe in. They want it, it, to, find, they want it be, to be easy to search and download articles. They want their articles to be timely. Sometimes we like to reread stuff that was published 15 years ago, but usually we're more interested in the cutting edge, what's happening now. They really do not want errors in their papers because errors mislead and errors make it difficult to read. You know, typographical errors. Um, readers don't like it. The evidence seems to be that they like their text to be enhanced. They like enhanced meta-tagging. So that if there is a reference, they can just hover their mouse over it and they can see that reference. Um, if there's a bit of video that you've referred to, to see that bit of video. And because they want to use um, that paper in the work that they do, they would like guidance on how to cite that paper. So, so much for the readers. And then we've got another set of um, criteria for the authors. It would appear, whether we like it or not, that um, a major choice of authors in deciding which journal to submit to is the impact factor. They wanted to have a good reputation, and so on and so forth. I won't, re I won't read all the way through these. We mustn't forget the reviewers. Reviewers will not review for an editor for very long if you give them rubbish to read. They go away. I'm not going to review for that journal anymore. It's too boring. So they want interesting submissions. They want the manuscripts to be in good condition so that they can understand them, they can read them. Um, well over half of our reviewers do not have English as their first language. So if the English is bad to start with, they're going to have a dreadful time. Um, they like, at the end, they like to get feedback on their performance. Not just to send a review back and to hear nothing back. They would like to know what the other reviewers thought. They'd like to know how they compared with the other reviewers. They'd like to know what the editor's decision was. So they like feedback. And there's more. Librarians. They're a, an important set of customers because they're the people who decide whether um, the institution will take that journal. Um, so they're looking to faculty for recommendations. They want, curiously, things to be published on time. If they're expecting a, an issue of the journal, even if it's an online journal, they would like it to appear on time. And they want things to be easy to access. The publisher, well, whether it's Elsevier, Wiley, whoever, would like the journal to be profitable. They would like to see the impact factor rising. They want the production process to be smooth. Manuscripts should appear on time. And they really do not want issues of intellectual property rights, plagiarism and things like that. They hate it because it takes up a lot of time and effort to sort. And finally, because a lot of journals are run by learned societies or run for learned societies. An interesting contrast between Barney's journal and mine is that because of the business model that's involved, um, BJET makes a royalty. Um, it delivers about uh, 70,000 euros a year to Bira the Educational Research Association. That's just because of the way that the model is. Barney's journal, the society, actually funds a journal. It's a different business model. It isn't that one's better than the other, it's just a different business model. The Learned Society would like the journal to have a high reputation. 
No learned society wants to publish rubbish. They too don't want intellectual property issues. Um, they would like it to be minimal costs to the society. And whatever those aspirations are, they would like it to meet the society's aspirations. This might be enhancing the reputation of the society because it publishes that journal. It might be that they want it to um, help early career researchers. There are a number of things that they might want and it needs to meet those aspirations because they too are a client group. And the problem, of course, is that the editor doesn't control all of these things. That's a list of some of the things that I think the editor can do something about if the editor has time. And one of the marginal things, but I think absolutely essential, is that um, the editor can control some of the marketing. And marketing is a key quality issue. So there we've got a list of the things that I think the editor can control. To a greater or lesser extent, it depends on the journal. I've arranged that I've got control over quite a lot of that. But I have the great luxury of being able to spend three days a week, sometimes more, on editing BJET. And there are a lot of journals who don't have that opportunity. And so some of these things they have to delegate, perhaps to the publisher, perhaps to colleagues. Now, this is where we come to the, um, the work in progress bit. That's a fairly classic continual quality improvement process, whereby you identify the key quality indicators, and then you look and see how well you're doing against them. And one of the ways of doing that is to start talking or surveying your six client groups. That produces a benchmark. That's where we are at the moment. But then you go into this cycle of saying, okay, what areas are we going to try and improve? Revise the processes to try and improve them. Reassess again. Have we made a difference? Is it better? Look at areas that we can improve now. Maybe you know, the next level's down. Maybe we have to take another look at the key quality indicators. You know, these key quality indicators don't seem to be doing you know, exactly what the clients want. So we may have, to, um, may have to modify them a little. Now, whereabouts is BJET on this? Well, BJET, we've made a start as a result of the invitation to come here. We've made a start on the identifying the key quality indicators. Our next step, as far as our own improvement process is concerned, is to start asking these client groups, how well are we doing? And then moving into that cycle at the bottom. But what I'm hoping is that I can persuade um, Barney to work with us um, so that we're not only doing this for BJED, but we're doing it for his journal as well. And also, because the two journals are quite different in the way they operate, but also to involve a, another journal from a science, technology, engineering, mathematics area, so that what we produce is something which is more broadly applicable that doesn't have the accusation that, well, that works for education journals, but actually, you know, I run an engineering journal. It's not going to work for that. So to try and get a much broader view of this, this is why it's a piece of work which is going to last um, well into next year, I think, even to start it, but which should produce something which is of value to editors of all journals. And it was this conference that stimulated that. So thank you very much indeed. Um, finally, quality takes time. 
You don't get quality on the cheap. You need to invest in it. It takes time, it takes resources. And I think it needs editorial continuity. Some um, societies like to change their editors on a regular basis, say every three years. And I think if you do that, quality is going to be one of the things that suffers because you need that continuity to go through the cycle. There needs to be time to go through the cycle. Anyway, at that point I want to stop. And who's on next? Thank you very much, Professor Nick. I think we can see it. Okay, the next, the next presentation, it's the title is The Main Characteristics and Benefits of an Open Journal. And the presentation is uh, by Professor Rory McGreal. Professor Rory McGreal is the UNESCO Commonwealth of Learning Chairholder in Open Educational Resources. He's a professor of the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University, Canada's Open University based in Alberta, Canada. <coughs> He's also the director of the Technology Enhanced Knowledge Research Institute, and he's co-editor of the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning, I wrote, and founder of the Open Educational Knowledge Cloud. Formerly, he served as Associate Vice President of Research. Of course, it's uh, Professor Mary, uh, Rory McGreal received many awards as a result of his experience in an open educational field. I think it's impossible to, <laughs> because well, it's a, a very long list. He also worked in uh, many countries and developed different roles. For instance, he has served as a member of a global advisory council of the Observatory of Borderless Higher Education. And presently, he is representative of the Canadian, uh, of the Canadian Commission of, for UNESCO and on the advisory board of the Canadian Virtual University. And he is also the director of the Open Educational Resources Foundation. Rory, please. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, it's good to be here. And I'm very grateful for the invitation to uh, speak to everyone about educational publishing. Um, our journal is the International Review of uh, research in open and distributed learning. We did change the name, uh, but we didn't change the acronym, so we're, think we're hoping we're safe. And uh, uh, we changed the name because we got uh, uh, $20,000 from uh, UNESCO in order to do so. <laughs> and um, and uh, um, the idea was to change the emphasis from uh, not just distance education, but to also include open education and blended learning and other forms of technology-enhanced learning. And uh, uh, we have done that, and uh, um, uh, we are now accepting a much more, a greater percentage of articles about open education. Um, this presentation is uh, also uh, 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 partially done, or. 50-50 between myself and Professor Terry Anderson over there, soon to be retired. And I always like to have Terry in the room with me because then I know I'm not the oldest person in the room. <laughs> Let's start off talking about scholarly uh, publications. And uh, um, it is clear that uh, um, scholarly pro publications are by far the most profitable sector of the entire publishing industry. And uh, it's pretty easy to understand why. Is, uh, they get the articles for free. They get reviewers for free. They get the copyright for free. And then they charge huge amounts of money to university libraries in order to access the content. So it's a, um, uh, it's a gravy train for the publishers. So they're not going to give it up, and they're going to fight to keep it. And uh, then uh, um, I'll talk more about gold open access uh, later. But uh, also now they've got a new scheme where they support open access. But now instead of giving them the publication and the copyright, you pay. I think, you know, wow. 
how brilliant these people are. They, they know how to money, they support open access, and now instead of, get it, instead of giving, getting it for free, you pay them in order to, to uh, publish with them. So uh, um, it's a very profitable part of, uh, uh, of the industry. And let's look, the world's largest publisher, Elsevier, they made uh, uh, 724 million pounds in revenue on revenues of $2 billion their profit, an operating profit margin of 36%, and uh, their CEO, he made 4.5 million pounds, not dollars, pound, that's about $6 million. Um, so yes, it's very profitable, and again, he's profiting off of free content, freely given with free reviewers, and uh, free copyright. Um, there was a recent uh, journal in, in Australia, the Medical Journal of Australia, that uh, just joined, uh, that was sold to Elsevier, and uh, the 19 members of the copyright board resigned. So there's an ongoing uh, battle between uh, uh, open access and uh, commercial uh, publishing in, in the journal scene. You often hear uh, people saying, well, how can open access, how can you sustain it? And uh, uh, from my cultural background, I'm an Irish background, and we often answer a question with a question. And we say, well, how can the present system be sustained? And right now, um, uh, actually a few days ago, uh, 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 last week, um, Harvard, uh, uh, decided they couldn't afford to pay for all the subscriptions. And there is no university today that can really, uh, can, that can afford to pay for all the subscriptions that are uh, uh, asked for by their, their uh, faculty. Uh, so that system cannot be sustained. We cannot keep paying. Our very small university 300, pays $350,000 a year uh, for subscriptions. Uh, an average university is paying in the millions of dollars for subscriptions. Um, this cannot be sustained. So when people talk about can open access be sustained, ask how can the present one be sustained? And we know it can't. They keep putting up their, their prices every year. Uh, their costs keep going down because of digitalization and yet the prices keep going up and up and up every year. Um, you can um, acquire the, uh, the database access in, in bundles and uh, they increase the pricing on journals all the time. They're, all, they're always jacking up the prices and uh, um, uh, I have below the, the link to the uh, uh, article on, the, on Harvard where um, they're basically saying they can't afford any more to pay these subscriptions. And if Har Harvard, with their huge uh, 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 endowments, cannot afford to pay for the subscriptions, how can the rest of us? So that type of a, uh, that scenario where we continue and continue to pay Elsevier and all of these other commercial entities um, is just not one that is sustainable. So we have to look at other ways of how we can ensure continuous access to scholarly research. And open access is one of the ways that we can do that. The way it is now is that the commercial publishers control scholarly publication. And we had a discussion about that uh, uh, this morning and it's they make the rules. They're the ones who come up with the uh, uh, citation indexes and, and, and uh, impact uh, uh, measures, et cetera. And uh, we have no control over that. Um, our community, our scholarly community, should be in control of that, but we're not. We're allowing these private uh, uh, major publishers to control uh, our field and our profession. 
Now publishers, uh, they're on the gravy train, so um, I don't really blame them for hanging on and uh, uh, maintaining their profit and, and uh, I do blame them for keeping increasing the prices when they're making so much money. Uh, but uh, they're going to keep uh, pushing to keep the gravy train coming. They've just got the money just keeps coming from them, from taxpayers through the university into their pockets. So they're very happy about that. Um, how are they reacting? Well, one of the ways is that the, uh, many of them have, have been ignoring uh, open access. And that was the first uh, stage when the open access movement began. And uh, that's changing now to where uh, uh, they're actively fighting open access. Um, they're lobbying, actively lobbying for anti-open access legislation. Um, a big one is they try to discredit the quality of open access. And uh, uh, they discriminate against open education uh, resources and uh, open access journals in citation index. It's very difficult to get your open access journal uh, accepted in the indexes. These are just some of the ways that they are reacting to the uh, growth of open access. And I mentioned it before, the best way you have to admire them, uh, they came up with the idea of we support open access and they came up with the idea of gold open access. That is, you pay us and then, we'll, then you can release it as open access. And this is wonderful, so now instead of uh, giving it to them, you pay them in order to, to do it. And the reviewers are all done for free. And so uh, you can see there that uh, uh, researchers, they pay the processing charges. It goes to the publishers. Uh, um, they get money from other sources, advertising, from donations, uh, other government subsidies. And uh, um, there is also the green open access, where really it's a green open access is nice, but you don't get credit if you want promotion or tenure. If you're looking for promotion and tenure by putting your, uh, your research into a repository, sort of trapped, you have to go into uh, journals that are indexed if you're looking for promotion and tenure. So, again, we have a question here. What, what is open access? And uh, SPARC, the uh, Society of, uh, um, uh, of uh, Publish, um, Scholarly Publication uh, and Research Council in the United States, they make it very clear that they want CC BY, the most open license, Creative Commons attribution. So it's open to everyone, shared by anyone, anyone can use it any way they want, they just have to attribute the author. And uh, um, others um, have added restrictions to that. And we started out that way. Actually, in Erodal, we started out before the Creative Commons license was available. And we just put it out online and anyone could read it. And that's the way a lot of journals are still doing it. They think they're open. Uh, because it's online and anyone can read it. Uh, but people can't download it uh, <coughs> legally unless you put a, a, share, uh, a sharing license on, like Creative Commons. Um, unless you're in Canada where we have very liberal fair dealing rights and you can download articles and, uh, and use them and distribute them to your class. Uh, but in most countries you can't do that. Um, then we decided, okay, we'll go to Creative Commons and we put in the two restrictions, no derivatives and uh, uh, non-commercial. Uh, we had a deathly fear that somebody would come along and make a lot of money uh, from our journal. And uh, the no derivatives, we didn't want them changing any of our articles. But after about uh, five or six years, we found nobody was looking for money to make money out of us and uh, nobody was changing our articles and we thought why do we have that, those restrictions in there and now we're fully CC by license and uh, uh, we no longer have those restrictions and I'd suggest that uh, 
those restrictions make it uh, difficult for people to integrate them with other license work. If you're putting a number of, uh, of open license work together, and some are NCC by, some are CC by ND, some are NC, this one's ND and NC, and you get a mishmash of different licenses. And that makes it very difficult for people uh, to make use of your work, integrating it with other work. Uh, we publish in Erodal uh, in four formats, and we believe that's a, a type of openness, where we publish in EPUB, pub, in PDF, in HTML, and in MP3. So, uh, um, again, that's another as aspect of what is open. Uh, you could have the best openly licensed material around, but if people can actually access it in some kind of an open format, then it, it isn't really open. Hegel uh, put it this way, uh, the synthetic solution to these conflicts can't be introduced unless those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. And we are being manipulated by the publishers. And we're taking their side. And we are helping to advance the, the, the agenda of the publishers. And this is a real conflict. There's a real conflict of interest here where scholars um, uh, want to share their resources to make their scholarship available as openly as possible. And uh, the publishers want to make money. And they can only make money by artificially restricting uh, the content, restricting it so as pe people who don't pay the money can't get it. Um, so they have a monopoly over their resources. And you heard today, um, and, and it's in official organizations, the term intellectual property. Now, in many countries this may be true, but in common law countries based on uh, British common law and American uh, uh, law, um, it is not true. Um, copyright is not property. It's clearly, and there's been major court decisions on this, is it is not property. Um, nor is it intellectual. If you look at Britney Spears and some of these other things, there's nothing particularly intellectual about it. But uh, they use the term intellectual property because we all like property and, and we believe in the principles of private property. Um, so that's why they use these terms, but they, they're using it in an Orwellian sense because what they have is a privileged monopoly that the government interferes in the marketplace and gives a monopoly to publishers with their copyright. Um, and uh, um, the, they have the monopoly now for 70 years past the death of the author. And uh, this is accept, uh, accepted, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, but it is not property. And I defy people to check it in, in, uh, in the British tradition, and again, I don't know other traditions as well, is it is a privileged monopoly. It is not a, it is not a property right. It is a copy right. In, in our, our legal system, you do not own the content. What you possess is a monopoly over that content for a limited period of time. And I think that distinction is very important. Um, but again, um, if we look back at what Hegel is telling us, we are buying in to their view. We're being manipulated to take their side and uh, to, to approve their agenda. Now here's a question uh, people uh, of great interest to us is, uh, does open access increase or decrease citation rates? And it seems the results are mixed. Um, and uh, there's been a, a few uh, reports on this and uh, cited, and uh, it's not as clear as we thought. We used to be saying, well, you get way more citations if it's open, but it's not that clear.
this graph shows uh, that uh, the, uh, the dark line is the uh, subscription journals and uh, the, the other top check line is uh, um, with payments. So if you pay the charge and uh, open access without APC is a lot less and uh, um, is further down. Uh, this is uh, uh, for, uh, uh, it's weighted now here, the citation averages for subscriptions born and ones that, uh, sorry, that for subscription journals, uh, born open access journals and converted open access journals. And as you can see, journals that converted to open access uh, do not have the same citation rates as do the uh, uh, subscription-based and uh, the, the born open access journals, and uh, uh, which are pretty well equal uh, these, uh, uh, as time went on, as open access became more popular. Here's another chart showing the average yearly citations for articles. Uh, uh, this was published in, in 2003 and 2004, 2005, 2006. And uh, again, this shows that there was a slight uh, um, benefit to having open access journals, that uh, uh, they were uh, um, uh, cited more than non-open access journals. So does open access uh, increase or decrease citation rates in our discipline? Um, well, an analysis of Google citations for uh, 12 distance education journal uh, using Hartzing's uh, publisher Paris tool, uh, six open access, six commercially published, and the results showed roughly equal citations per paper, uh, but uh, that uh, citations in open access journals were on their way up. They were on an upward trajectory uh, to surpass the uh, traditional ones. And uh, this graph shows that there's a very high correlation between the amount of views, the downloads of the papers, and the citation impact. So if you're looking at uh, how many views that one of your articles got, um, it seems to be uh, pretty clear that, that that parallels the impact factor. So uh, it's one measure that uh, um, we feel we can use. Uh, the technical production costs uh, for one issue of Erodal are here. Uh, we've got the hours uh, for each article, the cost for each article, and the cost for an average of 10 articles per issue. Uh, you can see there uh, um, the total is about $3,000, and we publish in four formats, the HTML, PDF, MP3, and the EPUB. And uh, so that's... Uh, uh, more or less the cost that uh, uh, we have at Erodal. And the number of downloads, uh, uh, notice here the blue line is the biggest, that's the HTML. So they're on the web, it makes sense that most of the downloads are going to be in HTML. Um, the red, the next highest, is uh, uh, PDFs. Uh, I guess people want to print it out more, they, they will use the PDF. And the light green is EPUB and the dark green is uh, MP3s. And although they're small, uh, it's about 70, an average of 70 uh, uh, downloads uh, per article. Um, it is not insignificant. I mean, there are people who are depending on the EPUB and the uh, MP3 format. The MP3, of course, is a, an audio format and uh, for visually impaired people, it's used uh, uh, quite extensively. <coughs> oh, that's twice, sorry. <laughs> Open journal system, publishing and review system. Uh, we can see here the growth in open journals and those using the OJS uh, system. <coughs> so we're talking about from uh, 1990, where it's uh, just a few hundred, now we're talking about 7,000 uh, journals using the open journal system. So that's a, a major growth trend as you can see going up. Now 
What are the benefits of open access? Uh, this chart from, by Danny uh, Kingsley and, and Sarah Brown uh, puts a lot into them, uh, but it, uh, it doesn't even mention the one um, uh, uh, that I think is, is, is really important. But let's go through. You get more exposure for your work. Uh, practitioners can apply your findings. You get higher citation rates, which is, it seems to be trending that way, but we can't really say that for sure yet. Your research can influence policy because people can get it from anywhere. The public can access your findings, whereas commercial journals, you have to go to a university library to get access. Um, it's compliant with grant rules. Uh, taxpayers get value for their money and researchers in developing countries can see your work. Um, but the reason um, I got into open access and into open educational resources was in the late 90s and trying to work with collaborators in different universities with different copyright rules and different copyright uh, um, uh, attitudes. And we found that we were trying to share uh, learning objects to create uh, um, courses on mobile devices and other things. And we found if it was commercially um, uh, copyrighted, we couldn't use it. We would have to get permission to, to, to use it in this way, permission to get it to use it in that way. You have permission to use it in those two ways and you find out there's a third way you'd like to use it and then you need permission for that and some of them want money for permission, and some of them, you don't even know how to find the person who owns the copyright to get the permission. And we found it became impossible for us to work with commercial content, that we needed open content in order to be able to do our work. And I think this is a, a really important aspect of open, uh, uh, of open education resources, open access, is that you're free to use it however you want. You can share it, you can change it, mix it, mash it. Do what you want with it. You cannot do that with commercial content. And it, it is very problematic. The worst thing isn't even paying. Sometimes the fee is only a few dollars, but it's the amount of effort that you have to put in to find who owns it and how to get the copyright, etc., etc. And, of course, another big problem that's come up uh, in the last two years, they've been around longer, but in the last two years it's becoming uh, uh, very noticeable, are these predatory open access publishers. Spammers, uh, they soliciting for gaining income. So, hey, gold open access, I'll set up my journal and uh, I'll solicit people and then you say, yeah, I want your article, please publish your article with me and uh, pay me $2,000. And uh, uh, they give names often quite close or even the same name as legitimate journals and it's a growing problem and they're nothing more than vanity presses but a lot of young uh, researchers uh, don't understand that and uh, could get themselves into a lot of trouble. Uh, these predatory publishers accept anything. All you have to do is pay them and uh, there's no real uh, peer review in it at all so we have to be very uh, uh, careful of that. This is a very un unfortunate aspect and when people are criticizing open access uh, they refer to these type of predatory publishers quite a bit and, and it, it blackens the name of, of, uh, of the really uh, le legitimate open access journals. David Gollop put it this way um, for those who are wondering about uh, opening up their journals. If you think that making money by giving away content is a bad idea, you should see what happens when one tries to make money selling your content. You know, very few educators are making money selling their content. I, uh, uh, I, I mentioned this morning my best-selling book on learning objects. Cost $280. It was a bestseller. I sold 350 copies. And I hardly made any money, I, my, money out. I think I got one royalty check once, and uh, uh, Terry and I uh, went to the pub and we drank it. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do? 
Well, um, here's some things uh, uh, that I'm doing and I'm encouraging other uh, um, uh, uh, academics to do, is submit only to open access journals. The more of us that do this, uh, um, the more, uh, the, the, the faster the, uh, the growth, the greater the growth of open access. Yes, and use open access repositories, even as you publish, uh, uh, as you uh, uh, publish with uh, uh, a commercial publisher. And I can see why, especially some young researchers who are looking for tenure, uh, go to the commercial publisher. But then put your article in a repository. Um, don't do any reviews for commercial journals. Why do that? Why should I donate my, uh, my time and effort so as uh, the president of Elsevier can make four and a half million pounds? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. We're all work. He's got millions of academics around the world working for free from him, and he's pocketing the money. So I say, you know, when I get a request from an Elsevier or other commercial journal, I say, sure, I'll do it, $100, and I'll donate the... $100 to the open access movement. Of course, they've never given me the $100. Then again, I haven't done any reviews for them either. Um, so uh, I've already been into the uh, problem of uh, gold open access and uh, uh, what a gravy train that is for the, uh, the, the publishers. Um, uh, I, uh, I think we've got to get away from that somehow. Uh, and find a way, uh, uh, other ways of supporting our uh, our open journals. And uh, the one I've, me I've mentioned is that uh, the library dollars can support it. Our libraries have a sustainable fund of money every year that goes to commercial journals. We can divert some of that money to open access. And as the open access movement grows, we can divert more of that money to open access. The money is in the system. We do not need new money. In fact, if we do this right, we could save money, save considerable money by moving towards open access. And I put it to you what other uh, ways we can uh, possibly achieve it. We, do, um, we discussed this morning, uh, uh, Martin Weller said he, he gives his uh, journal to a uh, non-profit publisher who does all the publishing for them. So we don't have to do the publishing in-house. We can contract with, uh, with publishers, usually small local publishers, and help build them up. And, but instead of the publishers controlling us, we control the publishers. So it's not against private enterprise or the publishing industry. On the contrary, this could be a boon for small publishers and uh, uh, in local areas. So, are you ready to t take the pledge? I'll no longer submit my work to closed publications, nor participate in review or editorial functions for closed publications. I'll leave you with that sentiment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. Well, the next presentation is Measuring, uh, measuring the impact of research today, traditional metrics and alternative metrics by Professor Barney Dalgarno. Professor Dalgarno is an associate professor in education and research fellow, fellow in the Center for Research in, in Complex Systems at Charles Sturt University in Australia. He has been researching in the field of educational technology for the past 14 years and he has over 50 publications in, in the area. His innovation in the use of technologies for teaching have been recognized nationally through the AXILIT, it's an association in Australia, award for exemplary use of ICT and tertiary education. Stemming from his background in computer science and his PhD in education, he has developed a reputation for having a deep knowledge of both educational theory and computer technologies, along with associated research methods. Professor Dalgarno is a co-director of UMagine project at Charles Sturt University. UMagine Digital Learning Innovation Laboratory 
is a think tank for educational innovation, a catalyst for new scholarship in online learning, and a laboratory experimenting a new educational paradigms and technology. Professor Delgarno is the editor of Australasian Journal of Educational Technology. Professor Delgarno. So thank you for that generous um, introduction. I'll just get my slides up. I can just click on the right button. Okay, so as Joseph said, I'm going to talk a little bit about metrics, some of the current ones and some of the ones that are emerging. Um, I'll give some definitions. I'll talk about some of the data sources that the existing metrics use, um, and I'll drill into a couple of those in a little bit more detail. I'll also talk about some of the new sources of data that, um, that we now have access to and some of the new metrics that have been devised that use these sources of data. And then I'll talk just a little bit about some of the implications for editors um, of all of this stuff. So a bit about AJET, first of all. Um, so AJET is the Australasian Journal of Educational Technology. I'm one of three lead editors of AJET. AJET is published by the Australasian Society for Computers and Learning in Tertiary Education, or Ascolite. It's a free open access journal with no publication charges. So um, I'm Rory's best mate, yeah. and not Nick's. <laughs> um, we draw on some funds from the Ascolite Association to allow us to pay copy editors and web hosting charges, I guess. So we're lucky in that respect. If we didn't have that, we might have to be um, Nick's best mate and not Rory's. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the journal has historically been a broad educational technology journal. Since 2013, following a review of the journal led by Ascolite, it shifted its focus to be solely post-school education. Um, and there are three lead editors. Just in terms of the size um, of the journal, I guess, um, or the size of the operation, I guess I've put the numbers up there. We had about 450 submissions in 2014 and we publish around about 50 articles a year. So a fair bit of um, production work there. Okay, so that's my kind of editing background. So let's have a talk about bibliometrics. Um, so according to Wikipedia, bibli bibliometrics is statistical analysis of written publications such as books or articles, including... Um, they're used to provide quantitative analysis of academic literature. Typically, citation analysis is one of the most common aspects of this. Um, and it's used for a range of different purposes to measure the impact of researchers or the impact of a particular paper. And I didn't go and edit the Wikipedia definition, but if I had time, I would have added the impact of journals, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so the basic data that um, bibliometrics um, have tended to draw on, I guess, uh, include um, the number of articles submitted. So when we're measuring um, the performance of a journal or an author, we can talk about the number of articles that have been submitted and the number of articles published. And then when we're talking about individual articles or authors or journals, we can talk about the number of views of the abstract of an article or a group of articles. And we can talk about the number of downloads of the full, um, usually PDF, of an article. And then most importantly, I guess, the number of citations. And by that we mean um, the number of times other published papers have included this particular article in their reference list. So that's what we mean by a citation. So some of the common um, journal measures or metrics that kind of draw on that, that basic set of data. Um, journal acceptance rate is one that people use as a measure of quality. So journals that accept the large majority of the papers that are submitted are generally assumed to be lower quality. Of course, it is dependent on the quality of what's submitted. Um, this is a difficult one because often um, journals don't make that available, or at least they don't make the, um, the data that it's dependent on available. Um, so you can't, you can't kind of treat it in a completely transparent way because there's some ambiguity depending on editorial processes. For example, do you count 
every article submitted and then compare that to the number published or do you only include the articles that are sent out for peer review and not include um, articles that were perhaps rejected editorial because they were um, perhaps sent to the wrong journal or you know, found to be unsuitable for some reason. A second measure is just journal article downloads, nothing fancy about that. Um, but they're not always reliable measures because of the fact that a lot of journals exist, not, they exist on their own website, but also in various databases and repositories. And, um, and so sometimes you're provided with the data from other databases so that you can kind of pull that together to work out the downloads of an article. But it's not always possible to see how many downloads have occurred in repositories like ResearchGate or even institutional repositories. So article download statistics are often difficult to get in a reliable way. So one of the most common journal, journal metrics, um, it's changed its name a few times over the years, its current name is the Thomson um, Reuters Journal Citation Reports Impact Factor, um, or Impact Factor for short. Um, there's a two-year impact factor and a five-year impact factor. And I'm going to unpack that one in a little bit more detail in a minute, but that's probably the most common one that people refer to in terms of the quality of a journal. The Google Scholar um, H-Index um, and H-Medium are newer measures and um, they've only been out in the last year or so, but I want to go into those in a bit more detail as well because I like the idea of including one of the kind of closed commercial um, measures and one of the kind of open measures just to kind of show that we've got a, diff a few different ways that we can get access to the data. Of course, Google are commercial, but they're commercial and open. Um, some of the less common journal metrics, but which are nevertheless important and they're used commonly for certain purposes. There's a couple of Scopus measures. The source normalised impact per paper um, is an interesting one because it's actually a weighted measure, weighted according to subject area. Those that um, read across various disciplines would be aware that, for example, in the medical discipline, impact factors around, you know, anywhere from 12 up to 20 are quite common, meaning that the average article is being cited in other papers, you know, 12 to 20 times, whereas in, um, in education, it's much more common for impact factors around the one to two mark or even lower than one, which means the average um, article is being cited, you know, one or two or less times. So the source normalised impact per paper um, corrects for those different citation practices across disciplines so that you can then compare um, the citation measure in one discipline with the citation measure in another. Now, there are differences of opinion over whether that's a sound thing to do because perhaps the citation numbers in the different disciplines reflect the actual citation practices of those disciplines and perhaps um, a higher number is actually a higher quality and therefore to normalise that is to kind of um, artificially correct. So there's some debate there. Um, the Scopus um, Saimajo Journal Rank or SJR is another um, measure that has a weighting according to the um, subject field, but it also has um, a weighting according to the quality of the citing journals. So journals that have a high SNIP would be weighted uh, if there's a reference from an article in that journal back to the article in the target journal, then that would be weighted more highly in terms of the overall rank, so that references from higher quality sources rate more highly. And I guess Intuitively, that sounds, um, you know, like it might be sound, but the more complicated the measure, the harder it is to kind of intuitively understand what it means and the more worrying it might be that you're putting a lot of um, weighting on this measure without really understanding how it's calculated. So one argument is go with the simpler ones because at least you know what their limitations are rather than the more complicated ones. So the other one I wanted to mention is the eigenfactor and article influence metric, um, 
which are journal ranking measures based on analysis of an article's um, centrality within the network formed by articles and citations within articles. So that's a bit complicated. But if you think about a, a kind of a graph, a network that shows nodes which are articles and links that represent references within that article to other articles and so on, and so that we have this massive um, network of articles and their references. Um, within that network, articles that are um, regularly referenced by other articles are going to be more central within that network, and articles that are referenced by other highly cited articles are also going to be more central within that network. So in a sense, um, you get a higher score if, firstly, your article is highly referenced, but secondly, it's referenced by other articles which are highly referenced and so on. So you can kind of see, you know, follow the trail to see which articles are the most important to the field using that, those measures. So they're interesting ones. They're not used a great deal, but I think there's a certain um, intuitive soundness to that, um, to that kind of measure. They're not pushed by any of the publishing companies, and this is, you know, this is why um, the Scopus and um, Thomson Reuters um, measures are the ones that are most commonly used, because certain publishing companies align themselves with those measures and promote them on their website, so they become the kind of norm in terms of the things that people report, and they build their own momentum. So I wanted to just explain in a little bit more detail one of these measures just to kind of give a better understanding of how they work and the kinds of drilling down that you might do as a journal editor or as a discerning author. So I'm going to look at the Thomson Reuters impact factor. When we see the term impact factor, we, it usually refers by default to the two-year impact factor, but there's also a five-year impact factor. And I've given the definition of the five-year one there. The definition of the two-year one is the same, but with, based on two years. So essentially, the, the five-year impact factor is the average number of citations um, for all articles published in a particular journal um, from articles in the current year. So when I say the current year, the, the most recent year that the um, Thomson Reuters impact factor data is available, I think is, I think we're still on 2013. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 2013 impact factor is essentially, it looks at all of the articles published in 2013 that are in that database, not all journals are in that database, so all of the articles published in that year and the references within those articles to articles published in AJET, for example, in the past five years before that. And then um, you add up that total number of references to AJET articles in that five-year period, and then you divide by the total number of articles published in AJET in that period. So essentially you're getting the average number of citations per article um, from articles published in the current year. So it gives you a kind of a measure of the impact that articles in AJET are currently having on the field, I guess. And the two-year one is the, you know, the most recent two years um, of articles. So it's a much more kind of current measure and therefore more fluctuating. There's no real bias in favour of high or low volume journals through this measure because, you know, whether you publish um, 200 articles a year um, or whether you publish 20 articles a year, it's still based on the kind of average number of citations per article. Um, so increasing the volume um, and, de and decreasing the quality can have a detrimental effect on the um, impact factor. So you want to kind of, if you want to keep the impact factor high, then the best way to do that is to keep the quality of the articles high and not publish things that are not likely to be cited. So if you look at the, um, the league tables, I guess, for, um, for the impact factor, um, and I've highlighted a couple of the journals that are represented here today or in the earlier session we had this morning. Um, you can see that in educational technology, the best is computers and education at 2.6 um, citations per article um, from, uh, for articles published in the past two years um, 
from articles published in 2013 and, and it kind of works its way down. Most of us are hovering around the one. AJET was slightly ahead of BJET the previous year. We used BJET as a bit of a benchmark, so we try and keep ahead of them, but we've slipped behind for a year because we had a couple of highly cited papers that slipped out of the time window of the two-year measurement, and that put us down. And I think a couple of the editors of our journal um, have published a couple of highly cited articles in BJET, which has lifted their, um, their scores. <laughs> you, win, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> That's right. Um, just to show you the sort of drilling down that you can actually do, um, this, is the, um, this is the kind of report that you get when you go to your journal database within your library um, system in order to kind of find out a bit more information about the, um, about the impact factor. You get your kind of basic um, two-year and five-year impact factor. Um, you get a fair bit of background information about the journal. Um, you drill down a bit further, it actually shows you the actual raw numbers of, um, of papers um, that were cited in each year. And so you can see how the, how the numbers are actually calculated because it tells you how many there were each year and, and works out the averages there. You can also drill in um, and find out which other journals cited articles in AJET. Um, and you can go the other way as well. And then through the Web of Science database, you can actually go in and find out which articles were the most cited. Um, and then you can actually follow the chain to see what, which articles cited those most cited articles. So that can be kind of useful. You know, this was one of the most cited articles in AJET. Um, in 2012, which is within the publishing window, and you can see that it's an article about um, student perceptions of Facebook. So you think, okay, well, that's probably a, a you know a hot topic. So you might say, oh, well, let's um, let's see if we can encourage some more submissions on the use of Facebook for learning because maybe that's a hot topic and we'll earn lots of citations and boost our impact factor. Maybe we could commission a special issue on um, the use of social media for learning. That would be an, a, you know, a kind of more thorough strategy to try and get some articles in that particular area. So you can kind of see how the thinking can, <coughs> can evolve. Okay, so the other, um, the other one I wanted to drill down to a little bit is the Google Scholar H-Index. Now, a lot of us would be familiar with the H-Index as a score for um, a p individual person's publication record, um, and the logic and, the, and the, the calculation is the same for um, for journals. They use the H5 and index and H5 median. The H5 index is the um, largest number H such that H articles published in that five-year time period have at least H citations. Now that's kind of tricky language to dissect. But if, for example, you have a journal with, um, that has 20 articles that have 20 or more citations during that five-year period, um, and the next most cited article only has 19, then the H5 index would be 20. But as soon as that, um, that, that next most cited article lifts up to 21 citations, then there are now 21 articles that have got 21 or more. No, the 21 has to lift as well. So those bottom two lift up a couple, then you bring, raise the H5 index up to 21. So the key thing with the Google Scholar H5 index is that there's a bias in favour of journals with high publication outputs. Obviously, if you're publishing 400 articles a year, then um, it's much easier to have 20 out of that 400 that have 20 or more citations, whereas if you're publishing only 40 articles a year, then you would need half of your articles to have 20 or more citations to get to an um, H5 index as 20. Um, and so it's also not affected by an increase in publication of low quality articles. So if this was the only measure that you were focusing on, you might just accept everything and, um, and let the um, readership decide which are the better quality articles and which ones um, to cite because you're not penalised for low, um, low impact articles. Whereas with the, um, with the Thomson Reuters impact factor, you very much are penalised for low quality articles. So you can see how you can kind of 
um, your, your editorial practices could be steered in different directions depending on which kinds of um, metrics you were focusing on increasing. So there's the league table for the um, Google Scholar H5 index and you can see that a, a larger number of the um, journals that are represented here um, have high indexes on this measure. So we, um, I guess we're a lot more online, so we do better on the kind of online database of Google Scholar rather than the sort of hidden closed database of, um, of Thomson Reuters. Um, again, BJET um, ahead of AJET on that one as well. But, um, Computers and Ed still ahead, and obviously Computers and Ed, those that are familiar with the field would know that Computers and Ed have drastically increased their volume of publication over the past uh, three or four years, and no surprise that as a result they've got a high um, H5 index. And again, through Google Scholar's um, metrics, you can drill in and look at particular um, subject areas, in this case educational technology, and the nice thing that you can do with this is that you can then click on um, the number of um, citations next to a particular journal and it'll take you in and show you um, those articles and you can see their number of citation. You can again make a bit of a judgement about the kinds of things that are highly cited and you can see there's one here that's focusing on um, Web2 software. So again that Facebook and social media seems to be coming up as something that leads to high citations or at least um, in that kind of period of 2010 to 12 that was the case. Might be old hat now so I don't want to do a special issue on Facebook and no one's interested. Okay, so there's a few changes to, the, um, to this whole territory that are interesting at the moment. So there's, there's new types of data that are becoming available. Um, tools like ResearchGate, for example, um, are providing new ways to access articles. So requests for articles through ResearchGate, for example, could be a new piece of data we could use um, in a metric. Social media mentions on things like Facebook and Twitter provides another source of information about interest from the community in articles. Um, social media likes, um, mentions in the news media provides a broader um, kind of measure of the impact that an article is having beyond academia. Recommendations um, through some kinds of social media systems Web links to articles could be also included, um, and bookmarks in things like Cite You Like. So all of these different measures um, can be used, and there's a number of new metrics that are coming out that are using some or all of these measures. A general term that tends to be used for them is alt metrics, but that's becoming a bit tricky now because there's a company called altmetric.com, and um, if we want to refer generically to alt metrics, it's kind of confusing because of that company. So maybe just um, alternative metrics. Some people refer to them as article level metrics, but of course, impact factor. Um, sorry, there are other article level metrics um, that, you know, the number of citations to an article, which are not really in this category of alternative um, metrics. So alt metrics um, is a article level metric, but it can be pulled at the journal or author level. Impact Story is another, and Plum Analytics, they're just some of the ones. And some of the commercial publishers are now starting to display some of these alt metrics on their pages. The problem is there's still, um, there's a lot of complexity because a lot of them are using a number of different measures and they're kind of changing the formulas. Um, there's trickiness because um, you can game them a little bit by kind of going, getting your friends to go on and, um, and you know, mention them on Facebook. So there's scope for kind of distorting the data. So what, why all this fuss about metrics, I guess? You know, are we interested? Uh, is it just something that our masters, I think Nick said, uh, you know, uh, are interested in or should we be interested in them as either editors, reviewers, authors or readers of journals? So I guess authors want to publish in journals with high bibliometric, bi bibliometric ratings and, and one of the reasons for that is that um, it's an indirect measure of the quality of an article. I've seen people within grant applications, instead of actually reporting the number of citations that a particular article they've, they've written has, has, they instead 
um, present the impact factor of the journal. So they're sort of saying, well, this journal has, tends to be highly cited, so it's a high quality journal, therefore this is a good article because it's in a good quality journal. So that's a kind of common thing for people to do. So that's a reason for publishing in a high impact journal. Journals with high downloads or high readership are attractive because obviously if we're, you know, whatever our motivation, if we're doing research, we want it to be read by a lot of people. And, um, you know, BJET is, a well, is well known to be one of the journals with the biggest circulation out there. So if you want to get your work read, not, might not be cited because it might not be of interest to people, but if you, the first step is to have it read. <coughs> and of course, journals with high citation rates give you some confidence of the likelihood of an article's citation. So if, um, if the impact factor of a journal is high, well, what that tends to say is that regardless of how many people are reading articles in that journal, they're tending to read and cite the articles. So perhaps that journal is read by genuine scholars who are actually going to do something with the work they read and go on and cite it. So again, you might be more confident that your article will be cited if you publish it in a journal with a high impact factor. Journal publishers, whether they're commercial bodies or societies or universities that are funding um, journals, want to be confident in the reputation of the journal because they want to be confident that they're not wasting their money. And so they're looking for any kind of measure of the quality of the articles published in a journal. So what are the implications of all of this for journal editors? Um, what, can a, what can an editor do to lift the citation performance of a journal? Well, for some measures, increasing the publication volume, that is, the, the quantity of articles published, can increase um, the, um, the metrics, but as I showed, that can also decrease other metrics. Decreasing the volume of low-quality articles through editorial peer or peer-reviewed processes. So if you create a kind of a stricter um, editorial review process, or a stricter set of guidelines for peer review, then that will hopefully get rid of some lower quality, lower impact articles, if, you've, if, you know, if you can predict those things. But of course, often the most methodologically sound and theoretically deep articles that um, get fantastic ratings by reviewers are too complex for the average readership and go unsighted. I know in my own case, the stuff of mine that has been the most cited has often been the review papers rather than the really gutsy um, empirical research. And that's just the, the kind of nature of the field. So just having rigorous review processes doesn't necessarily result in high citations. So targeting articles in areas likely to result in citation through invitations to submit or more commonly through special, targeted special issues um, or identifying accepted articles that are likely to be highly cited and moving them closer to the front of the publication queue. We certainly don't do that in AJEP. We publish articles in the order that they're accepted. Um, but I am confident that there are journals that do that kind of promoting of articles up the queue because they think this is a really timely submission. We think this is going to be really interesting to people. So how do you identify articles that are likely to be cited? Well, content analysis of published articles is one way that you could do that. Maybe analysing the author's publication record. So, I mean, I've never heard of anyone doing that, but theoretically you could kind of start to target in on authors that you think have been highly cited before and trying to, you know, encourage them to submit. We did a little bit of an analysis of AJET's most cited articles just in terms of analysing the category of articles. And um, we found that some of the most cited articles tended to be those review papers or case studies rather than the, say, experimental um, kinds of studies. But that's not an exhaustive review. Um, and I'd, it'd be interesting to see some more thorough kind of work in that area. I think there has been some kinds of work done. So just a couple of cautions to finish off with. Um, citations only show the academic impact of articles. So articles that are, have a really major impact on the profession, whether it's the higher ed prof um, teaching profession or the school teaching profession, for example, um, that might not necessarily be highly cited because sometimes the impact occurs in other ways rather than through um, the kind of academic citation of publications. Journal citation indices 
are only helpful for exploring the average impact or the impact of leading articles in a journal. If you want to figure out what the impact of a particular article is, it's much more important to see how many times the article itself has been, citated, rather, been cited rather than the kind of average citation for that journal. So, you know, much more important if you're trying to promote the quality of your publication output in your grant applications to actually focus on, you know, how much your work is cited. And a lot more work is needed on alt metrics before they can really be relied upon. So conclusions, um, as editors we need to be aware of the metrics used by our stakeholders and we need to understand how those metrics are calculated so that we can have a more sophisticated understanding of the kind of imp implications of our editorial decisions on the metrics. We don't want to be driven by the metrics, but we also don't want to do things that are going to have a detrimental effect on the, on the metrics without knowing that it is going to have a detrimental effect. And there may be actions that we can take that, um, that are quite consistent with our overall quality publication mission, but will, which will also increase our citation rates. And having special issues on topics that our readers are interested in you know, that's a valuable thing to do in any case, but it should also increase the performance on metrics. And I think that's all I've got time for. Thank you very much, my name. Okay, and now it's uh, time for the last uh, presentation. It's, uh, title, the title is Offering Support Services to Authors, Improving Academic Quality of Scientific Journals and Their Contents by Professor Gil Kirkuk. Professor Kirkor is a senior lecturer in educational technology at the Institute of Educational Technology at Open University in UK. She is fellow of Royal Society of Arts and of the Higher Education Academy and the member of Association of Learning Technologies. From 2008 to 2010, she was seconded to the UK, UK Resources Centre for uh, Women in Science, Engineering and Technology as Head of Research, Data and Policy. She was researched and writing about gender and technologies since the uh, 1980s and is uh, the author of numerous journals articles as well as of the co-authoring and the co-editing eight books. She is particularly interested in gender and learning technologies and in the opportunities provided by new web technologies for knowledge creation by women and, gen and, and about gender. Professor Kirkup is uh, editor of Open Learning, the Journal of Open Distance and E-Learning and Associate Director, editor, sorry, the, International, the International Journal of Gender, Science and Technology. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'm also quite pleased to have the last slot here because when we were asked uh, to give a presentation, we were given our topics and we also, uh, also offered to talk a little bit about the journals um, that we edit. And uh, since I think I've been defined by Rory as a foot soldier in the evil empire of commercial publishing, and I feel it's a, a very small foot soldier you'll see compared to the scale of some of my colleagues here when I talk to you about our number of submissions. I want to give you another perspective, which is you know, how uh, this particular journal, established in the days of print journals, has, uh, is in a certain pragmatic and economic situation, which isn't, if you like, a, a deliberately uh, ethically chosen position. Um, it's where we find ourselves, but also I, can, I think I'll argue that that's why we spend quite a lot of time thinking about how to support authors. So, what I'm going to do is spend some time talking about a brief history of open learning, which I hope you find informative in terms of what has been talked about so far, and a bit of our present publishing activity, and uh, one of the things we've all discussed here uh, indirectly um, is the issue of business models and new challenges to how we publish in this field at all, before I get on to the topic of author services, which you asked me to do. So, um, the history of open learning is that it began uh, an in-house journal by the Open University in the UK, a high-quality print journal that the university originally thought was for its professional development of its staff. And for those of you who know anything about the Open University UK, its staff was huge because they were a huge part-time body 
of local tutors scattered all over the UK and then Europe. So this was a very large body of thousands of people. But it was a print journal that became very popular outside the university and was sent to wherever anybody asked for it. I would see that as an early version of open access publishing. By the end or um, the middle of the 1970s, it was a victim of its own success. The university could no longer afford to produce this high quality print journal and distribute it from everywhere from the Outer Hebrides and Scotland um, across to China. So the university looked for a partner among a commercial, commercial publishers in order to actually generate some income from the activity that would actually support the university in continuing to produce it. So at the beginning of the 1980s, it first went to Longman and it changed its name. That was when it was first called Open Learning rather than teaching at a distance and it turned into a subscription journal which w the university got enough free copies of to distribute to staff, but then was a subscription journal to everybody who wasn't a university staff member. Now, the model was based on the kind of um, contractual model that uh, BIRA has with BJET, which is that of um, a professional or scholarly body that is actually in partnership with a publisher to produce a scholarly journal. So when we look at our contract, they keep on talking about um, things like, you know, the society, and we have to keep crossing it out and saying, no, the university. In the 1990s, the title expanded to have uh, distance learning and then eventually e-learning, which um, I, I agree can be a bit of a mistake if you keep on growing your title. Um, in 2000, it became available online as well as in print, but it was only in 2012 when I took over as the editor that we put the whole management system online. The previous editor, along with many other journals, commercial journals, probably outside of our field, still like to get their um, submissions um, as email file attachments. Um, and in 2014, we adopted the green gold open access route. Now, in the UK, this is a very common uh, thing among journals, and it may be less common in other countries where research is funded differently, and I'll mention it uh, why later on. So what we do every year, we, we only have three issues, but actually, over time now, we only get about 50 submissions over the year. So we're not talking anything like the scale of submissions you've seen in other journals. So some of the expansion of the field and the move to open access journals certainly has reduced the number of people who submit to this. We have a 56% rejection rate, um, but with not having a huge body of excellent submissions to pick our papers from, we do spend a lot of time working with authors whose papers look as if with work and help they can be made to publishable quality. So um, this is why I'll talk more about the, the support we give authors. Because we don't have a huge backlog of papers, we also can deal with them quite quickly and once accepted, publish quite quickly. We have um, a, a, an editorial board who are basically in an advisory capacity and I am the editor and we have an editorial assistant and she and I do all the work, which you might think is fair enough if we only get 50 submissions a year. So we still publish in print as well as online um, and in discussion with the publisher, quite a lot of our subscribers still want a print version. We believe this is probably a transition period of keeping print and we did explore whether or not it would reduce our subscription price if we were only online in order to actually make the journal cheaper. It would, but not a lot. But the other advice we got from both um, uh, subscribers and from our editorial board is there are still places in the world where internet access is so irregular that um, libraries, university libraries and students like things in print because they can't guarantee that there'll be internet access when they read it. We've even published papers about this. And also in some areas of the world, one of our um, board from South 
uh, America said that there was still a status attached to having a print version of a journal and he felt that it added to the status to be able to point to the print version. But I um, imagine this to be a transitory uh, period of keeping print because it is constraining so that if we did have a lot more submissions of excellent papers, we'd be hard put to publish them because we're restricted to 300 printed pages in a year, three issues of 100 pages each. And we must keep an exact equivalent version of record online as we have in print. So um, we can add other things to um, the uh, online version, videos, data, but we can't actually add a different set or additional papers from those that are um, in print. Um, now, uh, I wanted to say, well, I'll say it at the end. Well, this is to give you, we, we look um, and see ourselves as very much an international journal. Although roughly half of our submissions are from the UK, we do get submissions <coughs> in dribs and drabs from across the world. And that uh, other little diagram shows them. Um, our submission rates since we only turn towards the end of 2012 to the online submission system that shows just a small number of papers and um, the data only goes up to the beginning of March so it doesn't show the whole of 2015 but our downloads don't reflect the same countries of origin as our submissions so that although you saw that half of our submissions are from the UK only a quarter of our um, full text downloads come from the UK and Central Europe. So we have, um, and our publisher um, you know, comes back and tells us that this is looking good, the amount of downloads that we're getting from places like grow growing markets like Asia um, and Asia Pacific, um, places like that we're pleased with. Then we can get down, uh, figures on downloads of, from individual institutions and you'll see that some of the top institutions downloading who have a, an institutional subscription are uh, in Greece and South Africa and uh, I'm sorry but I don't know where the National Chaotung University is so I can't Taiwan. tell you sorry Taiwan. that's Taiwan um, so you can see that we do have institutions that in those countries that are making great use of, down, of downloads as well as access to print now um, uh, the business model. Um, for those of us who've done kind of basic economics courses, the first thing you learn in a basic economics course is there's no such thing as a free lunch. And so applying this to journals, there's no such thing as a free journal. So what I have to look at as an editor is where did my resources come from in order to do what I can do to get three issues of a journal out. So from the open university perspective, we, the, the Tiller and Francis get some income from subscriptions, downloads and licenses to republish. Um, and the, um, if papers are gold, then the author pays uh, on publication. But mainly, income is not coming from that. That's a very small proportion of activity, probably only about one or so each issue. So it comes mainly from various ways of paying to access the papers. A proportion of that comes back to the university, roughly £17,000, and we use that now. We're giving some of it back so that every issue we can pay for a gold open access that we choose. Um, it pays for the salary of an editorial assistant a day and a half a week and for expenses for me to come to things like this. So uh, it, I paid for my EasyJet ticket out of it. Um, the Open University donates in terms of time, my time, and other universities are donating, you know, as Rory said, all those other related activities, reviewing editorial board activity, etc. But we are suffering from... Rory's kind of campaign because some past authors and reviewers won't submit to us, they won't review for us because we're not platinum, i.e. completely free to everybody, uh, much as I would love to be. Um, I don't know where I would get the resources to do this outside of the flow from the publisher. Tiller and Francis users, their part, I don't know about profits, so I'm not going to talk about those, but what they actually use it for, and there there's often seems among my colleagues not quite an understanding of um, what publishers do. 
It designs and maintains the website, and since I've actually had experience of both Taylor and Francis as Scholar One submission and, and um, manuscript management website, and <coughs> had to work with the own, own open journal system in my uh, other work, I know which one I prefer, and I have to say I am very impressed with and would like to continue to work with the quality of uh, the website, both for um, the management of um, the submissions and the whole processing of them that I get from Taylor and Francis. don't care how it comes or who pays for it, but that's the quality I'm looking for. After we've done the academic work with the authors, the final copy editing, layout and production, the pr production of print and the um, distribution of print and the um, maintenance of the website are all done by Taylor and Francis. So these would all be things that we would have to do and find resources to do if Taylor and Francis weren't doing them. They also do a great deal of publicity and marketing, both for the journal and individual papers. Um, and um, although we encourage authors to actually do their own and we give them advice on how to publicize their work when it's printed, uh, the publisher constantly is going back and doing um, special topic of the month and making a whole set of papers free. So there are lots of marketing that we don't have to do because the publisher does. So all of this reduces the amount of activity that we academic editors or the university would have to engage in and reduces our input of institutional resources. Now what might an alternative business model look like for us? Well, we have been told clearly by our university that they would not be able or willing to fund the activities at present offered by the publisher or replace the income provided by the publisher for the, for the payment of the editorial assistant. So, historically, it found a commercial publisher just for those reasons. So, in our case, being uh, hosted in a university and... Um, and branded by that university, that university is saying we would pull out of the whole enterprise unless you found some other way of replacing the income and resources that presently um, the commercial publisher provides. UK universities are hard pressed to fund the publishing activities of their own staff. So the research councils in the UK are now funding publishing through research grants for research projects. So that researchers are being told there's money in your project to actually fund publishing results of your project. But if you're not in a well-funded project, then somebody else has to find the, re the, the money to publish it in a gold way. My university's comment was, why should we fund the publishing activities of staff in other institutions? I, well, if the journal only had papers in it from our university, we might be willing to fund it, but not as long as it's a journal which publishes from the field. So my um, interest is in how could we stop being part of Rory's evil empire, but actually look for um, an alternative source, because we don't actually have the same sources of income as Rory has. For example, the British research um, funding organisations will not fund journals because they've said we've spent all our publishing money by putting it into all the research bids. So every research bid has a proportion of money in there to publish with. They may not choose to publish with me. So that is our um, problem at the moment. Um, I did want to just pick up on something that uh, Rory talked about. We actually do give copyright back to the authors. The issue isn't copyright. The issue is actually publication rights. So our publisher never ever owned the copyright for what was published in the journal. Embarrassingly, my university owned it. So the university owned the copyright of all the papers, but the publisher owned the publishing rights. The university never made any money out of the copyright, so I talked them into giving it back to the authors, and the commercial publishers are totally pleased with that, because actually it's not the copyright they make money out of, it's the publication rights. Right, author services. Because, as I said, we're actually a small concern relative to some other people here, we do actually want to have 
enough good papers to produce three significant issues every year. I didn't um, put any um, uh, impact measures in. We weren't in the old social science index. We are in Scopus. We are not among the top at all, but we're not quite on the bottom. So we are increasing our <coughs> impact measures, if you look at the Scopus impact rating. But for us, one of the ways to do that, as well as getting better papers submitted, is to, as I said, to help authors submit better papers and work on the papers they've submitted. And I began this in thinking, well, how, if we don't have commercial publishers, um, do we replace what commercial publishers offer to um, authors? Because one of the things commercial publishers are now saying is, look, we are growing our authors' support. Authors now have personalised portals where they go in, they can see their reviewing activity, their authoring activity. We offer all these resources online for them. You know, we're offering hosting for their data. We're trying to engage with authors so they see us more than just somebody who prints their papers. Then I thought, it isn't just the publisher who offers um, or, uh, support to authors. Actually, in every part of the process of producing the journal, we offer support to authors. One of the things that we uh, find is that we are getting, all of us, um, more and more papers coming from countries that have um, no tradition of publishing and writing in English and not a big tradition of publishing what look like <coughs> academic journals. So we need to engage uh, very early on with um, authors. Taylor and Francis, I'm not selling Taylor and Francis, they are just pragmatically the people that we publish with. Anybody else gives us a better deal, I'll buy it. Taylor and Francis now have a whole site of um, services to authors with guidelines on everything from ethics, all these pull-down menus. Um, as somebody said, do authors really value them and do authors really use them? I would have said, seeing some of the papers that we see, not always, but they're there, and we can point authors to them when we start working with them on a potentially publishable paper. What we find is from the very beginning, we, we're actually giving guidance on academic writing, advice on the quality of English, uh, helping people understand the requirements of a particular journal. When we reject a paper, I, even if I don't let it go for peer review, I just look at it and know it's wrong. I always send back to the author an explanation about why we're not taking it any further, which may be to do with the quality of English, and then I advise about getting an English-speaking editor. It may be to do with the academic writing, etc. Um, authors need to have a very clear submission process that gathers all the necessary data at the submission point. That's very helpful so for them and for us, so we don't need to go back to them for various kinds of metadata, for their institutional data. Often we need to help them understand the submission process, so they often don't submit everything they should have done the first time around. Um, and we need to go back and engage with them, even at that point of finding we've got partially submitted things. Lots of authors don't understand the peer review process um, and need to um, have that talked through. And then the manuscript and production schedules part of producing a journal just seems to be things that academics would rather not know about. So they feel once the paper's accepted, they can go on holiday, uh, even though they've been told they need to be around to check proofs and things like that. So they need, we need to engage with them at all of that. Um, we, need, we engage most heavily at the review and decision-making process, and we've talked about this a lot this morning, about quite a lot of what reviewing ends up being is mentoring and advising. So we need a good system that's transparent to everybody. We need to be able to locate appropriate reviewers, and we need to have really good reviewers. And a lot of places and publishers are now offering courses in, you know, training reviewers. One of the things that uh, some of us do is we make sure reviewers always get back all the reviews for any paper they've reviewed so they can see what other people have done in their reviews and hopefully up their game by comparing what they did to what their colleagues did on the same paper. So we need really high quality reviews to give good feedback to authors because there are a great many papers, if worked on in the proper way, will be publishable. 
So those are the papers that we in our journal want to work on and work with the authors. We also have to give clear feedback. So as the editor, I don't just take the reviewer's comments, cut and paste them in and send them back to the author. I look at them, there are often contradictions and different focuses, and I try and guide the author into which bits of the reviewer's comments should they be acting on primarily, things like that. Authors should be able on the website to, to see at what point in any process their paper is. So my aim is to send any author that isn't being rejected very clear directive advice about what needs to be done in order to achieve a better goal at having uh, their paper accepted at the next stage. I sometimes at that point get um, queries from authors about you know, what's come up in the review process. But even if I don't, I think in terms of professional activity, those kinds of letters should not come as simply form letters out of a system as an automated response. Actually, they, I always rewrite them to take account of the author and uh, things like that. So there's a lot of human engagement which is quite resource intensive. Then in the production period, how we help the author, although they may not think it is, we do a round of academic editing. Uh, then the paper's copy edited by the publisher's uh, copy editor, but mainly that's for things like style, but also um, all your citations are checked and validated through the cross-reference database, which you probably didn't do as the author. Um, then we need authors to understand how they need to check this, and then what the publisher does is creates this version of record and submission to Crossmark, which is really important if your citation impact measures matter because that becomes the thing, that version of record against which everything else is measured. <coughs> and you can reduce your um, impact measures as measured at the minute if you've kind of spread yourself or, or this piece of work around a lot of things like uh, non-reft um, uh, papers at conferences, but they're up there, and then people cite them, but they don't cite the one in your journal. So there are all sorts of uh, issues to do with that. And then we will help authors who want to add additional online resources and video and database to support. And then post-publication, which I think is what we now all understand needs to be done, but 10 years ago people didn't, academics saw just getting published as the end product, is we need to help and advise authors on how they can get uh, people downloading, <coughs> reading and thinking about their papers. We offer them banners that they can add to the sign-off on their email, which says, I've just recently published this. We do marketing and promotional material. We, um, we do it. The publisher does it. We give advice in a letter to authors about the things that they could do. The publisher helps the author track the citations, and you'll know you get these little emails from publishers saying your paper's just been cited. And the, um, the publisher has this very robust platform with that version of record. And all of those things are things that I think any um, business plan for really secure, high-quality academic publishing. All those activities need to be wrapped up somehow or other and resourced from somewhere or another to, to give most potential authors the best chances of publishing their material and to get the best material published in the field. So, what next? Well, we need to provide more and improved author services, but that means more resources and both um, academic and technical, and where will they come from? Um, and how can new sort of processes and new business plans help to release or create those resources? For me, pragmatically, in the journal I work with, that's the key question, which means we will survive or not survive with finding an answer to that. Um, so, if you have some of the answers, we'd be very pleased to test them out in open learning. Thank you. Um, well, I'd just like to begin by thanking all four of our panel participants for their presentation today. So that's uh, Nick Brushby, Barney Dalgano, Rory McGrill, and Gil Kirkup. Um, we're going to take about a 10-minute comfort break now, 
And during that, we're asking you to think about the questions you might like to ask the panel. There's some paper up here on the table at the front if you'd like to write your questions on and leave them up here on the table. We'll try and answer them when we come back. Okay?